So, first thing uh, I'd like to ask you, how long have you been studying the Arctic? Um, over 40 years, um, since 1970. Since 1970. And um, what changes have you noticed in the Arctic since then? Well, pretty massive changes. When I first started working up there, uh, there was a lot more sea ice than there is now, and it was a lot thicker. Uh, it had many more pressure ridges. Uh, on average, it was more than twice as thick as it is now. So it's the appearance of the Arctic Ocean has completely changed. Um, I remember seeing in the in the film uh, Lawrence of Arabia, someone at the at the point asking him, "Why do you like the desert so much?" And I remember him answering, "Because it's clean." So I have the feeling that you also really like <laughs> uh, the Arctic in some way. Um, you really love that place for some reason. Uh, yes, I've, I've come to like to love it. Um, when I first started in in 1970 in, in science i was uh, doing oceanography alone that is uh, i was on an oceanographic ship for a year and we visited the arctic and the antarctic and that got me very interested in ice but before that i, I was envisaging uh, a career in, in pure oceanography visiting nice uh, warm seas <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, going back to the arctic and colder seas still colder seas um, any of the recent um, events in the rate that the ice is melting has surprised you in any way well uh, no uh, not not because um, everything that is happening now is simply the, uh, the the consequence of the thinning and retreat that's already been going on for about 20 years or so so um, back in 19 uh, 87 I was first I, I detected thinning of the ice for the first time by comparing two submarine voyages a few years apart and wrote that up and and uh, from the rate of thinning uh, and already the rate of retreat which had been seen by satellites you could judge that by now uh, most of the ice in summer would have gone and that's just what's happened so uh, all these people who say it's completely unexpected what's happening at the moment uh, is only because these are people who've never studied ice and so they get surprised by to see these these uh, the way in which the ice is is uh, disappearing but in fact that that's been a trend that's been visible for uh, at least two decades so why do we keep getting all these uh, provisions and predictions and reality keeps being uh, worse than the worst predictions? Uh, well, it's, it's often because the predictions are made by uh, modelers, and um, modelers became dominant in science, in, in environmental science, in fairly recent years. Before that, when we, when we didn't know much about the world, we'd go out and measure it, and that's if you were an environmental scientist, that meant you went out and tried to measure what was going on and, and detect phenomena that were unknown. But today, because of this explosion in a number of scientists, without an explosion in the amount of money being spent <laughs> on science, most of them can't afford to go in anywhere, so they sit in, in a lab with their computers and, mo and do modelling and call that science. But I don't. I, I think you... you the, and the reason why the models um, are not predicting the, the rate at which we're, we're seeing retreat is because they don't put all the physical processes in because they, they haven't actually gone out and measured anything. So there's, there's a lot of physical processes that are important that we're only just beginning to understand and, and haven't got, found their way into any computer models. So uh, I think that's also maybe one of the reasons why we keep get predict, getting predictions for the year 2100. And I find that strange because I have the feeling that um, we don't have enough knowledge yet about the climate to make predictions that long. And, uh, and so I'd like to focus on more short-term um, sequence of events because I think it's very hard to make predictions for many decades ahead. And on the other hand, we are a very creative species and we may end up pulling some tricks uh, out of our sleeves. And, uh, by the way, what kind of tricks these may be? Well, I don't know. Uh, it, it, you're thinking about, uh, can we do anything to reverse the process? Yes, going exactly. 
Well, I think we have to. Um, it's not a matter of uh, unless we can, things will just keep going on, getting worse. But because they can only get a certain amount worse, and then humanity itself is threatened, and that, that's what's happening now. If we uh, if we look forward about twenty to thirty years, uh, and we don't do anything, we'll be reaching uh, a climate which is um, several degrees warmer than it is now. I mean, we the the Paris Agreement for trying to limit climate global warming um, speaks about two degrees as being the maximum warming that will uh, we can endure without major impacts, and that those those impacts beyond two degrees, first of all. Uh, start out with very big losses of, of crop yields so that there'll be a famine. Um, but the, to keep the, the, the warming within two degrees requires enormous efforts which um, the the official bodies, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, don't say anything about. They just say, well, we can't do this without artificial means of reducing carbon dioxide content. But they don't say what those are. So um, we're left with having to think about ways in which we can reduce carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that really means very uh, spending a lot of money on technology that can scrub carbon dioxide out of, out of the atmosphere and uh, uh, faster than we could put it in. Uh, so mm -hmm. if, we can, if we can develop that, then, then we've actually managed to beat climate change and we can get back to a stable climate. But if we don't, or we don't put enough effort in to implement uh, that sort of technique, then then we're stuck with warming, which becomes so high at great that it will threaten uh, our whole civilization. But you know something, just uh, a couple of days ago, I, in this fish tank right behind me, I had a problem with cyanobacteria, which also happens in, in the ocean from time to time and uh, get people panic because they managed to kill a lot of fish and uh, it's a problem. And so what did I do? I intervened. I intervened and I put something here to kill the cyanobacteria. Well, in result of that, I started an anoxic event inside this tank. <laughs> <laughs> which is something which also people talk about the ocean in the future possibility of it becoming anoxic but I started in in very short term I think in a matter of uh, minutes because I was trying to solve the problem with cyanobacteria I started an anoxic event here so in messing on purpose also with the climate and given the lack of knowledge full complete knowledge we have about our atmosphere and all the processes in the world don't we run also into a, a big risk of messing up even more the situation? Well, yes, we do. Uh, that's the danger, because uh, everything we've done up to now has messed up the world. The, the whole industrial revolution and, and the burning of fossil fuels, that's, that's what's caused the mess. Um, so if you were cynical, which I guess I am, uh, you would say, well, anything we can do uh, by technology is only going to make things worse. But uh, I guess my view is uh, it, it may, maybe it would, but it's the only chance we've got. We have to depend on technology. Um, and it's certainly the ocean is very, very vulnerable. In fact, I was going to ask you a question that uh, uh, I, I spent a few years working in a, an oceanographic lab in France where marine biology was, was very uh, much being done, although I was doing physics. And the, the, the head of the lab said, which I thought was maybe something very important that people don't realize, which is that in the ocean, especially in the near surface waters, if you go in a kind of a straight line, then you only have about four molecules of water before you reach a molecule of, or a, a piece of something living like cyanobacteria. Or, uh, uh, yes. So, <laughs> really, the, the ocean water is actually a kind of soup uh, and uh, that's that's something I haven't realized before but uh, it means that it's very very vulnerable well but of course here I was managed to make changes very quickly but uh, whatever changes we may come up will take uh, some time to produce effects so in when we're speaking in a time frame of 10 15 years even if we start it tomorrow, whatever effects we have coming, uh, I think they are locked in. Uh, am I correct? Yeah. 
Yes, we are. I mean, we're, lo we're locked into, firstly, the, the existing level of carbon dioxide, even if we stopped emitting it, would, would produce at least another one to two degrees of warming because the full potential warming uh, hasn't been realised. Uh, so it's no good just reducing our emissions. First of all, we would have to stop them, and then we would have to actually reduce the CO2 level, uh, and that, that's where we need the technology. Uh, but it won't happen quickly, and it certainly won't happen quickly because n no money's been spent on it at the moment. Right, Even right. if we develop the techniques that, that, that will work and that are cheap enough, then you have to actually implement these. You have to persuade all the governments in the world to spend a large amount of their taxpayers' money on on uh, in devices to, to, to clean carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And that will be an enormously difficult thing to do, especially when you have people like Trump around. Yes. Um, and, uh, well, given that, uh, when do you expect to see the first, what's called the Blue Ocean event, a nice free Arctic for the first time? We can expect that in which time frame? Well, uh, ice free Arctic in summer, that's in, in September. Yes. Um, I would expect um, within a couple of years, maybe next year or year after. It won't be this year because we're now pretty advanced into the summer and we've still got some ice left. But, but as, as, as we know, the, the, some of the most persistent ice is, or is disappearing this year in the north of Greenland. And uh, I would expect that that Blue Ocean event might well happen next year or the year after. Well, we already see that uh, now the jet stream, uh, which in fact helped us in keeping the cold air in the Arctic in its place and the more warm air in the southern regions in its place, the jet stream is now doing the opposite. Sometimes it's helping bring hot air into the Arctic and bring Arctic air down. So when the, uh, the ice is gone, uh, how that will affect the jet stream, which is already completely different than what it was? Well, I think what you can expect is when the ice is gone, um, we're going to have an even warmer Arctic because there'll be uh, much more absorption of, of uh, energy by, uh, from solar radiation by the water. So the water will warm up uh, as soon as as soon as there isn't any ice there. And that the temperature difference between the Arctic atmosphere and the tropical atmosphere will get less, even less, um, and that will weaken the jet stream even more. Uh, because the, the jet stream depends on that temperature difference. So we can expect the jet stream to get even weaker so that these great lobes which bring um, warm air northwards and cold air southwards, they, they well, we, I don't know what we will actually get, whether we'll get just bigger, longer lasting lobes, so even more of these uh, uh, weather anomalies, or whether the jet stream will just cease to exist because there isn't enough energy to drive it, in which case there'll be some kind of huge mixing event going on in which you will never quite know which, uh, what part of the global atmosphere you're in, in, in any, in, in Europe or America, it will be, um, it will make present climate uh, weather anomalies look, look, look like nothing because there be, won't be any persistent weather patterns at all. That, that, so Yes, so how long will uh, those effects reach the southern hemisphere? Well, um, in theory, um, they, they, these effects should already be affecting the southern hemisphere, but the, the Antarctic seems to be able to isolate itself to some extent from, from the Arctic and, and lower latitudes. So because, because it's a, it's a very cold continent, a high elevation continent, with an ocean around it, then the, it, it, it seems to be able to resist uh, the changes, or well, the changes in Antarctica are happening more slowly than in the Arctic. But they're still happening, I mean, the Antarctic ice sheet is losing mass. It will become the chief source of, of sea level rise uh, when Greenland has, has, has lost a lot of its material. So in the long run, Antarctica will come in to the picture, but at the moment it's uh, it's the Arctic that's dominating change. So, going back to the northern hemisphere, uh, and given that I think the jet stream will have a huge impact in our climate, um, in this, 
the jet stream being turned into some sort of chaotic wind pattern, um, how will that affect our ability to grow crops in the northern hemisphere? Well, it's, it's already, that village is already affected by the, uh, the, the weather extremes that we're having. I mean, there's been uh, a loss of crops whenever there's very cold period during a critical phase in, in their life cycle or a very hot period when it's getting near harvest time. So already uh, crop production is affected and the price of food, the global price of food that the FAO maintains a, an index of that. Is, is going up and it's that and that's really uh, dangerous for um, well for, for everybody who's who's poor and that means an increasing number of people in in cities in the third world and um, like for instance in Africa where you've got the biggest growth of population is occurring in cities where obviously the population can't grow anything and have to buy food and if food Starts spiraling in price because of of production problems, then we we could have a very serious situation of of famine. So this means that uh, although the problems is now appearing to have uh, more evident, uh, strong evidence in the Arctic, the first part of the human population that will suffer will be in fact in the southern hemisphere, particularly in the poor regions. Yes, that, and that's that's unfortunately the case. It's in fact it's usually the case that the people who are causing all of this are rich are the people in rich countries because America, the US, is responsible for 25 percent of the CO2 that goes into the atmosphere. So they won't be well; they will suffer, but they won't suffer to the point that they die. But the the people who really suffer are people in 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 Africa and um, in uh, South America, people in 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 third world cities and, and the Middle East. That's, those, are, those are going to be the, the people really suffering uh, first of all, while the people who are doing the, the, the uh, climate change, creation of climate change, are the people from the rich world. When we're talking about suffering, which means it will affect a huge number of people, but let's be a bit more concise about what you mean by suffering. Well, I think um, Initially, it's going to be a uh, high price of food uh, because of production of difficulties of crop production as as the climate becomes more unstable, and that uh, well that will reflect within individual countries and cities. In it already has been in, uh, reflected in social unrest, for instance. The if you look back to the, the yes. Arab Spring, that was uh, the Arab Spring coincided with a year in which the food price index had risen to more than double what it was in in the year 2000. Yes. And so, if you if you have another big rise in the food price index, then the first thing before people start dying will be unrest and and revolution and civil war, all the horrible things that that come about when when a large part of your population is is not able to to live properly and after that will come actual famine so um you although there are now forecasts that the pop the human population will stabilize somewhere in the 2050 around 11 billions do you believe that given that uh, what's happening to the climate and our ability to grow crops uh, even in the long run do you think we'll have any chance of reaching 11 billion or will be um, be put in check by the the events in the climate well i sort of fear that something will happen um the the un uh, program uh, environment program made predictions about the population in the year 2000 and it was sh and, and dividing the world up into zones and they felt that most parts of the world would rise maybe 30 percent in population uh, Europe would actually decrease but Africa would was behaving or will be behaving completely differently it's going to quadruple in population from about a billion to four billion and that seems impossible um, because already it's difficult to feed everybody with a billion and to have four times as many 
just doesn't seem possible. But, I mean, the, the UN presumably bases those predictions on present rates of reproduction and family size, and, and it assumes there won't be any catastrophes. It assumes nature will take, sort of normal nature will take its course, in which case the population of Africa will spiral out of any sort of level where people can can be fed and um, it would have to be almost entirely fed by imported aid food aid which and again it's difficult to see how that amount of food aid will be provided when the countries that do it like the united states are, are turning to other things they're using uh, their f food to make uh, biofuel which is to keep their suvs running and uh, not providing it any more to Africa as aid. So I could see a disaster coming along, and um, whether that disaster is, is famine or whether it's something else like, a, a, like some kind of a giant infection, um, I don't know, but I, I don't think the population's going to be able to reach 11 or 12 billion. That's something's something's going to happen that's nasty to stop it. Okay, thank you very much, Professor.